Hey guys, this video is about colligative properties. Um, and specifically, the colligative properties we're going to talk about are called boiling point elevation, freezing point depression, and osmotic pressure. We've already seen one colligative property when we talked about Raoult's law, that is vapor pressure lowering. <clears throat> so first we'll talk about boiling point elevation. This actually follows directly from Raoult's law. We know from um, the discussion on Raoult's law that by adding a solute to a solvent, we lower its vapor pressure. Now, if we, re we remember that the boiling point is the temperature at which the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to the pressure above it. If we, by adding a solute, we decrease the vapor pressure of a liquid, that means we have to increase its temperature in order for it to equal the pressure above it. And so we've increased its boiling point. Now remember, the reason why adding a solute to a solvent, to a liquid, um, decreases its vapor pressure and thus increases its boiling point is that the solute particles at the surface of the liquid take up space. There is less room available for the solvent particles to escape into the gas phase. So in this picture right here, on the right, we have pure solvent. Um, this is the top of the liquid, this is the liquid down here, this is the solvent, uh, excuse me, the gas phase up top. And so we have this equilibrium going on where we have um, liquid molecules escaping into the gas phase and gas molecules recondensing into the liquid phase. Um, <clears throat> but overall, once we've achieved equilibrium, the number of gas particles on average stays the same and that's what causes the vapor pressure above this solution. Now, by adding the solute to this solvent, which is this picture on the left here, less space available for molecules, liquid for the solvent molecules to escape into the gas phase, so at the same temperature, and of course the same pressure above the solution, um, there are fewer molecules of the solvent escaping, fewer molecules in the gas phase at equilibrium, a lower vapor pressure. And so by adding a solute to a solvent, we um, elevate its boiling point. It will not boil until it reaches a higher temperature, at which point then the vapor pressure of the liquid will be equal to the pressure above it. So there's an equation that describes the, the elevation of a boiling point, the change in the boiling point. And that's this equation right up here. It's a pretty simple equation. This says that the change in the boiling point, delta means the change, remember that's final minus initial, so the difference, is equal to the Van T Hoff factor times the molality, this M is the molality of the, the solution, times a constant called the boiling point elevation constant. Um, now, the boiling point elevation constant depends upon the solvent and not the solute. Um, because remember, colligative properties um, are properties that depend only upon how many solute particles there are and not their identity. Um, <clears throat> And also, just to remind you, the reason we um, that molality works here instead of molarity um, is that um, molality does not change with temperature, whereas molarity does, because when we change the temperature, um, we change the density and thus the volume of that solution, and so the molarity will change. So, um, and this is just a reminder of Van T Hoff factors. Um, again, you do not have to memorize any Van T Hoff factors. You do not have to memorize the boiling point elevation constant. I'll give it to you here for water, and if you need it during a problem, I'll give that to you also. Um, <clears throat> so that's a boiling point elevation. Um, and just the thing to remember is this is the change. This is the, the, the final minus the initial boiling point. So the boiling point with the solute minus the boiling point of that solvent without the solute. So here's an example. Let's calculate the boiling point of a solution that we make by dissolving 62.786 grams of iron 3 chloride in 74.922 grams of water. Um, we're going to take the boiling point of pure water as 100.0 degrees Celsius, so one atmosphere pressure, and the boiling point elevation constant of water is 0.512 degrees Celsius per molal. Um, so the approach here is going to be, we're going to use the boiling point elevation equation. Um, we want to find um, the, well, we're, we need to find the molality. Um, we're given the boiling point elevation constant. Um, we can look up the Van Toff factor, plug in, um, and we can find the delta T, uh, B, and that means we can find the new boiling point. So why don't you guys go ahead and work this out. Come on back when you get an answer. Welcome back, guys. So... <clears throat> 
the boiling point elevation um, equation. Um, it's iron 3 chloride, so we look it up in this table here, and it's 3.4 is the Vantoff factor. So that's our I. Um, we're given the boiling point elevation constant, 0.512 degrees Celsius per molal. Now, really all we have to do is calculate the molality. And remember guys, molality is moles of solute over kilograms of solvent. So to get the moles of the solute, which is iron 3 chloride, we just take the mass of the iron 3 chloride, divide by its molar mass, and that gives us the moles of the solute for our molality calculation. Um, the kilograms of solvent, well, we were told that it's 74.922 grams of water, which is the solvent, so just moving the decimal three to the left, that gives us 0 0.074922 kilograms. Dividing these two, we see that our solution is 5.1664 molal. Now we can plug into the boiling point elevation equation, I times the molality times the boiling point elevation constant. The units of molality cancel, um, we end up with positive 8.99 or 9.0 degrees Celsius. So remember now, that's not our answer, right? Um, that's because we know that um, water boils at 100 Celsius. So this is our delta TB, which is the final boiling point minus the initial boiling point. So we can rearrange this equation to solve for the new boiling point, and we get 109.0 degrees Celsius. The next cogitative property we're going to talk about is freezing point depression. Just as adding a solute to a solvent always increases the boiling point of the resulting solution relative to the pure solvent at that same pressure, by adding a solute to a solvent, we always decrease its freezing point. It always freezes at a lower temperature. Um, and the basic reason for this, there's we, you know, the farther you go into chemistry, the more you learn about this. We talk about things like chemical potential and entropy, but this explanation works at this level. So if we imagine what, ha what needs to happen for a solution, for a liquid rather, to freeze, let's look at the right-hand picture. So it's water and ice, right? So the white would represent solid ice and the blue would represent liquid water. So what has to happen is the temperature of this liquid, the water has to be cold enough so that as the, mo so that as the molecules of water move past each other, they're moving slow enough so that the intermolecular forces can make them stick together and form a solid. And so they have to stick together and they start forming this clump of solid. And as, by the way, as this process is occurring, the solid and the liquid phase are in equilibrium and the temperature stays the same during that whole phase transition. Now let's imagine the same water, but now we've added a solute to it. Well, the solute particles will get in the way. They'll they'll prohibit some of these liquid water molecules from sticking together because the solute particles are between them. And so um, it's, it's harder for those um, water molecules, liquid water molecules, to, to start um, solidifying, to, to sticking together, basically. Um, and so we have to decrease the temperature so that on average, the average kinetic energy of these particles is low enough so that enough of them start sticking together and we start forming a solid. Um, so we have an equation here that describes the change in the freezing point, the, boiling, the freezing point depression, just like we do for boiling point. Delta Tf is equal to Van Toff factor times the molality of the solution times the freezing point depression constant. Um, this is going to be dependent upon only the solvent, but it's going to be different, a different number than the boiling point elevation constant. For example, for water, remember the boiling point elevation constant was 0 0.512 degrees Celsius per molal. Well, for water, the freezing point depression constant is negative 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal. Notice the negative sign here. Okay, This is the convention we are going to use, guys. All freezing point depression constants will be negative, which gives us a negative delta Tf. And that's what always happens. And it depends upon what textbook you look in. Some textbooks, they have the Kfs as positive numbers, then they have a negative sign in this equation. Same result. And some of them, they don't, everything's positive and they expect you just to know that it's negative. But this is the convention we will use. All Kfs will be negative. Um, so there's the freezing point depression con uh, equation. And um, again, you know, Van Toff factors, it's just a little table of them. Let's go do an example. All right, so we have 2.484 grams of an unknown molecular compound 
and we add it to 49.523 grams of cyclohexane. That's going to be the solvent. The unknown will be the solute. And the freezing point of the resulting solution is negative 2.14 degrees Celsius. We're asked to calculate the molar mass of the unknown molecular compound, the solute, given that the freezing point of pure cyclohexane without the solute in it is 6.50 degrees Celsius and that the freezing point depression constant for cyclohexane is negative 20.0 degrees Celsius per molal. All right, so our, our approach, guys, is that um, we want to now, now we want to find the, the, um, the, the molar mass of this, this compound. Remember, molar mass is grams over moles. Well, we already have the grams of the unknown compound, 2.484 grams. That goes in the numerator. To get the rest of the problem is finding the denominator, the moles of the unknown compound. The idea is that if we can solve the freezing point depression equation for the molality, which is moles of solute, which is the unknown compound, divided by kilograms of solvent, well, the solvent is the cyclohexane. We know how many grams, and thus kilograms of it we have. So if we can find the molality, multiplied by the kilograms of the solvent. That'll give us the moles of the solute, the unknown. So we just take the grams divided by those moles and we have our answer. All right, guys, why don't you go ahead and work that out and come on back when you get an answer. Welcome back, guys. So the freezing point depression equation, the molar mass is grams per mole. The grams were given 2.484 grams. Um, to get the moles, the bottom part here, the denominator, we'll take the molality from our freezing point depression equation times the kilograms of solvent. And this is just the freezing point depression equation rearranged. Um, now, because we're told that it is a um, molecular compound, that means that the Fantoff factor is 1. Right? Molecular compound means that it is not an ionic compound. It does not dissociate. Okay? So it's an exactly 1. Um, we're given the freezing point depression constant, negative 20.0 degrees Celsius per molal. Um, to get the, um, the change in freezing point, we take the final temperature, which we're given is negative 2.14 degrees Celsius, the freezing point with the solute in it, minus the freezing point without the solute in it, the initial, minus 6.50 degrees Celsius, and we get negative 8.64 degrees Celsius. Just a word of warning, guys. Watch your signs here. It's really easy to get them mixed up. Anyway, so we have our delta TF, negative 8.64 degrees Celsius. We have that. We have our KF. We have our I. We can plug in, and we can get our molality. So, um, oh, so negative uh, delta TF, uh, negative 8.64 degrees Celsius, or delta TF. I is 1. KF is negative 20.0 degrees Celsius per molal. And we see that our solution is 0 0.432 moles of unknown per kilograms of solvent. All we have to do now is take this times the kilograms of solvent. We were told that it was 49.523 grams of cyclohexane, the solvent. So we just move the decimal 3 to the left. That gives us 0 0.049523 kilograms. And we get 0 0.02139 moles of our unknown. Well, that's the denominator in our molar mass equation. So all we have to do now is take the mass of the solute divided by the moles. And that gives us our molar mass, 116 grams per mole. All there is to it. And the last colligative property we're going to talk about is called osmotic pressure. Um, now, <clears throat> osmotic pressure um, comes about when you have a semi-permeable membrane that separates a pure solvent from a solution. Now, what the function of the semi-permeable membrane is it allows solvent molecules to pass through both ways, but not the solute particles. And so what happens is, as on the, the side of the membrane where there's pure solvent, at any given instant, there are more molecules of the solvent passing through than there are on the other side because there's less space at the surface of the semi-permeable membrane. Some of those solute particles block the solvent particles from getting through. So we have more molecules going from pure solvent to solution than we do the other way of solvent molecules, which means what happens is the solution on the side that has, well, the solution side, it's, it starts gaining solvent, right? And it keeps happening, right? And so what that does is that increases. If you imagine this picture is, is a picture we have in mind. This is a U-shaped tube, and there is atmospheric pressure pushing down on this. Okay? If you go back and you, and you look at um, um, the, the gas chapter, 
um, you'll, you'll see this, this kind of thing happening. So as this column rises, it creates a pressure down there until the pressure exerted at the base of this column right here balances the pressure going up. Once it reaches that equilibrium, that pressure that it's exerting at its base, that's its osmotic pressure. So as it goes from here to here, this column rises, this difference is the osmotic pressure. Remember, pressure can be um, given in terms of things like millimeters of mercury, mm -hmm. millimeters of water, inches of water, what have you. And that's just this height right here. So that's how osmotic pressure comes about. And it's, it's important in a lot of um, um, biochemical processes. Cells um, um, are basically semi-permeable membranes. And, and there's osmotic pressure in blood cells, and there's all kinds of uh, interesting things going on there. So the equation that describes the osmotic pressure is this equation right here. Pi stands for the osmotic pressure. It's equal to the Van T Hoff factor again. Time, now this capital M is molarity um, times the um, gas constant, 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres per Kelvin mole, times the temperature in Kelvin. So there's the osmotic pressure equation. Let's do an example. Um, 4.182 grams of an unknown non-electrolyte, so non-electrolyte once more means the Van T Hoff factor is 1, is dissolved in enough water to make 239.2 milliliters of solution at 22.4 Celsius. The osmotic pressure of the resulting solution is 6,998 torr. We want to calculate the molar mass of the unknown compound. So once more, our approach is going to be um, looking at what we want to find, molar mass. Units of molar mass are grams per mole. Once more, we're given the grams, the mass of the, the, the solute, 4.182 grams. The rest of it is finding all the moles of, of the solute, which comes from the osmotic pressure equation. And where moles comes in in the osmotic pressure equation is in the molarity, that capital M, because remember, that's moles of solute, which is what we want divided by liters of solution. So if we can solve the osmotic pressure equation for the molarity, the capital M, all we have to do is take that and multiply that by the liters of solution. Well, we're told how many milliliters, so we know how many liters. And that gives us moles of our solute, which is the denominator in the molar mass equation. So why don't you guys go ahead and work that out. Come on back when you get an answer. Welcome back, guys. So osmotic pressure equation. Um, the, you want to find the molar mass, which is grams per mole. Grams is 4.182 grams. Moles is the molarity times the volume. Remember from our solutions chapter. Um, volume, we're told, is 239.2 milliliters. Move the decimal 3 to the left. We have 0.2392 liters. Um, rearranging the osmotic pressure equation for the molarity, we get pi over IRT. Um, and because the units of um, R are liters atmospheres per Kelvin mole, we have to convert our osmotic pressure from torr to atmosphere, so we divide by 760, and we see that our osmotic pressure is about 9.2078 atmospheres. Again, because it's a non-electrolyte or molecular compound, um, the Van T Hoff factor is equal to 1. Um, and so the temperature, okay, we're given in degrees Celsius, we're going to have to turn invert that to Kelvin, so we add 22.4 to 273.15, and we get 295.55 Kelvin. Plugging into the, our rearranged osmotic pressure equation, we see that the molarity of the equation is 0.37966 moles per liter. Taking that, using this equation here, multiply times the volume, we get moles of our unknown, 0.090815 moles. And that's our denominator for our molar mass. So grams, which we're given, divide by the moles, and we see that it's about 46.05 grams per mole. And that's all there is to it.